Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Today we're again taking a look at VRM thermal performance, this time of seven mid-range Intel Z590 motherboards, priced between $220 and $330 US. Now I have already checked out eight of the more entry-level models, and I'll be sure to compare that data with these more expensive versions. But before we get into the results, let's very quickly take a look at each board's VRM design, and I'll start with one of the cheapest models we have here for this roundup, the ASRock Z590 Extreme Wi-Fi 6E. The Extreme Wi-Fi 6E costs $250 US, and this in my opinion is about the price point where Z590 motherboards start to get good in terms of the features they offer. And we certainly saw that previously with the $240 US MSI Z590 Torpedo and ASUS Tough Gaming Z590 Plus. When compared to those motherboards, the Z590 Extreme really only adds wireless networking, though there is a Wi-Fi version of the Tough Gaming. Anyway, it's the VRM that we're mostly interested in. The Z590 Extreme, on paper at least, looks very familiar. In terms of the core components used, it is identical to what we saw on the much cheaper Z590 Pro 4 from ASRock, and that board didn't exactly perform overly well in our testing. So what we have here is a six-phase V-Core, with each phase using a pair of Vache 50 amp power stages, each of which feeds into a pair of inductors. That said, there are some interesting and noteworthy changes. The Z590 Extreme features a much higher quality heatsink, which extracts heat from not just the power stages, but also the inductors. And the inductors themselves appear to be of a higher quality. And that can help with thermal performance. So there are some upgrades on the surface which could improve this model, so I'm interested to check it out. Next up, we have the $280 ASUS Prime Z590A, which comes in at $40 over the tough gaming version featured in the previous video. Basically, you're getting a few more USB ports, which is always nice to see. Legacy connectivity like PS2 has been dumped, and there's an extra PCI Express Time 16 slot. What hasn't changed is the VRM. The same seven phase, 14 50 amp power stage V-Core is being used. So it looks pretty much like a direct copy and paste job. Same inductors and very similar sized heat sinks. And that means thermally these two boards should be pretty similar. So there's not much more to say about the Prime Z590A. Let's move on. For an additional $50, you can get the ASUS ROG Strix Z590A gaming Wi-Fi. Very long name there. Does include some stuff like wireless networking, as the name suggests, a BIOS flashback feature. So I'm not sure you'll ever need that though, as there's gonna be no future CPU support, but. You've got it anyway, three additional fan headers, and the Supreme FX ALC4080 codec. The VRM has also been modified, though it's only a very subtle change, swapping out the on semi 50 amp power stages for Vache 50 amp power stages. Other than that though, the configuration remains the same. The Vache power stages are more efficient, so we should see some kind of thermal improvement there, and the heatsink is significantly larger, and perhaps more crucially, isn't partially covered in plastic. So, the ROG Strix Z590A Gaming Wi-Fi is a much better looking board in my opinion, but it is also 20% more expensive, and at $330 US, it really is a very expensive motherboard. So, it'll be up to you as to whether or not the price premium is worth it. Moving on to the Gigabyte boards, we have the Gigabyte Z590 Aorus Elite at just $220 US, or $230 for the AX version, which obviously includes wireless networking. Basically though, the base model of this board is just $10 more than the Gaming X version tested in the previous Z590 video, and in terms of board features, they are very similar. The Elite offers a few more USB ports on the I.O. panel, optical audio out, and it drops the PS2 port. As for the VRM, it remains exactly the same as what we found on the Gaming X, the only real change here being made to the cooling, which might be a slight improvement with the Elite, though they do look very similar overall. Just to recap, you're getting a 12 phase V-Core using Vache 60 amp power stages, each of which feeds into a dedicated inductor. The design did work okay for the Gaming X, so the Aorus Elite should be a decent board in terms of VRM thermal performance. Personally, I much prefer the look of the Aorus Elite. It looks a bit more professional, let's say, and for $10 more, the added USB ports are a decent bonus. Now, if you're willing to spend an additional $60, you'll unlock the option of the Gigabyte Z590 Aorus Pro AX. And this finally looks like a serious Z590 motherboard. The I.O. panel looks suitably high-end. There are a dozen USB Type-A ports and a USB Type-C, Wi-Fi, high-quality audio using the Realtek ALC4080 codec, and Intel 2.5 gigabit networking. 
And in addition to all the extra connectivity found on the IO panel, Gigabyte has significantly upgraded the 12 phase V core, moving away from the 60 amp Vichet power stages of the Aorus Elite to 90 amp power stages. The ISL 993-90-90 amp power stages are seriously high quality components, so I'm expecting good things from this board, and really at nearly $300 US it'd want to be good. Gigabyte's also included some pretty serious looking cooling, so as usual it's always the more extreme VRMs that get the best cooling, which kind of doesn't make sense, but that's just the way it is. The real finned heatsink on the left bank of power stages should work very well, though it is partially obscured by a plastic IO cover. Anyway, a good looking board this one, so I'm keen to see how it performs. Now over to MSI, and up from the $240 Z590 Torpedo that I looked at previously, we find the $270 Z590 Tomahawk. So it is priced very closely to the Gigabyte Z590 Pro X that we just looked at, and I've got to say, in terms of features, this MSI board appears to be a little bit lacking. It's not lacking in any significant way, but you are getting a better equipped IO panel with the Gigabyte board. Not only that, but when it comes to the VRM, the Tomahawk looks nowhere near as good as the Aorus Pro AX on paper, though it has to be said the VRM is still quite substantial as you're getting 14 60 amp power stages in a teamed configuration, so two per phase for a seven phase V core. That's still obviously a very impressive VRM, but the Gigabyte model should offer almost 30% greater current handling, so it'll be very interesting to see how the two compare in our thermal tests. Now MSI does offer a beefier board for just $10 more, the Z590 Gaming Plus. As far as features go, it is a very similar motherboard. That said, the Gaming Plus does drop the Wi-Fi support, but you get an extra PCI Express x 16 slot. The big change though has been made to the VRM. The layout of the VRM remains the same, so it's a seven phase vCore using teamed components, but where the key difference can be found is in the power stages used. The 60 amp alpha and omega power stages have been swapped out for higher rated Renesas 75 amp models. So that is quite a significant upgrade. It means the current capacity of the Gaming Plus should be very similar to that of the Aorus Pro AX. So if you don't care for the built-in Wi-Fi, the Gaming Plus in my opinion is better than the Tomahawk, and I personally do prefer the look of the Gaming Plus. That is a subjective opinion, but you know, the board looks better in my opinion. Of course, what it will come down to is how it performs, so let's move on. Actually, before we get to the graphs, we need to talk a little bit about the test conditions. For this testing and any future LGA 1200 VRM thermal testing, I've built a dedicated system inside the Corsair 5000D airflow case. Powering it, we have the RM850X power supply, and for the cooling, we have the Corsair IQ H150i Elite Capelix White. The 5000D has been configured with a single rear 120mm exhaust fan, and then we have a single 120mm in the front, acting as an intake fan. Then at the top of the case is the H150i 360mm radiator with three 120mm exhaust fans. This is a pretty standard configuration, airflow is good, and in a 21 degree room I'd say it's a fairly optimal setup. For recording temperatures I'm using a digital thermometer with K-type thermocouples, and I'll be reporting the peak rear PCB temperature. Finally, I'm not reporting delta T over ambient, instead I maintain a room temperature of 21 degrees, and to ensure a consistent ambient temperature, a thermocouple is positioned next to the test system. Now for this testing, I've got three configurations using two different 11th gen processors. The first test uses a stock Core i9 11900K, as I'm interested to see how each of these boards configures this processor. Then of course I'll overclock the 11900K for a stress test, and then for a more relaxed stress test I'll also be including the 11600K, both of which will be overclocked to 4.9 GHz using 1.35 volts. Then for stress testing I'm using the Blender Gooseberry workload, which will be run for an hour, at which point I'll be reporting the maximum PCB temperature, again using K-type thermocouples. Okay, so here's a look at the VRM thermal performance using a stock Intel Core i9-11900K processor. And the first thing you'll want to note here is the fact that this is not an apples to apples test. The sustained CPU or core frequency can vary quite a bit, with ASRock's Z590 boards again being by far the worst here, though they are still running within the Intel spec. Basically, ASRock's decided to limit all the Z590 motherboards that we've looked at so far to what we call the Intel base spec, so the 125 watt TDP in the case of the 11900. It is worth noting that ASRock's the only board partner to do this, with ASUS, Gigabyte, and MSI all running the 11900K at between 4.7GHz and 4.8GHz depending on the board. 
Out of interest, I did remove the power limits using the Intel XTU software and saw that the 11900K boosted up to an all-core frequency of roughly 4.8 GHz when using the Extreme Wi-Fi 6E. This only increased the VRM operating temperature by 11 degrees, which is perfectly acceptable, and it meant that at a peak of just 62 degrees, this ASRock board ran very cool, so that was great to see. If we ignore the stock 4.4 GHz configuration of the ASRock board, all of these Z590 motherboards ran at between 57 and 64 degrees in our testing, so a pretty tight grouping. The only result that really jumps out at me here is that of the Gigabyte Z590 Aorus Pro AX. For what really should be the best performing board, a peak operating temperature of 63 degrees is very underwhelming. It's possible the out of the box configuration isn't as optimal as it should be, so let's move on to do some manual overclocking. Okay, so with all boards overclocked to 4.9 GHz, power consumption from the wall increased to between 371 and 388 watts, depending on the model. It was the ASUS ROG Strix Z590A Gaming Wi-Fi that produced the best result, running 5 degrees cooler than the MSI Z590 Gaming Plus, which was the next best model. The MSI Tomahawk also did really well, running just 3 degrees hotter again at 68 degrees, and then we have the ASUS Prime Z590A at 69 degrees. Again, the ASRock Z590 Extreme did well, peaking at 70 degrees, which is just 10 degrees hotter than the best board we tested. Now, although performance was acceptable, the Gigabyte models were a bit of a letdown. Well, in particular, really it was the Aorus Pro AX that was the letdown. The Aorus Elite really wasn't bad at 72 degrees, despite being a bit hotter than competing boards, but the Aorus Pro AX was a serious disappointment, as this really should be the best performing board, not the worst. While a peak operating temperature of 75 degrees for the underside of the PCB is very acceptable, given the components used and the fact that this board costs almost $300, it's a pretty underwhelming result. The similarly priced MSI Gaming Plus, for example, ran 10 degrees cooler while drawing more power from the wall, which could point to a less efficient VRM, but still, it did run much cooler. For those of you who never intend on pairing your Z590 motherboard with an 11900K, or don't believe you'll be stressing the CPU for extended periods of time, this is how they got on with the Core i5-11600K. Basically, all boards passed with ease, with none hitting 60 degrees. So for overclocking the 6-core part, any of these boards will be overkill. As a recap, here's a look at all 15 Z590 motherboards tested to date. The first batch of cheaper boards that I tested in my previous video, they've been given a lighter shade of blue in the bar graph. So as you can see, boards like the Tough Gaming and Torpedo stack up really well here, though they're not really that much cheaper than the more mid-range boards at $240 US. From the previous video, the MSI Z590A Pro was a real standout in terms of value, as was Gigabyte's Gaming X and UD. In fact, it's pretty crazy to learn that the Gigabyte Z590 UD actually ran cooler than the Aorus Pro AX in this test. How, how that's possible, I don't know, as it really shouldn't be. Gigabyte has clearly messed something up here. Even the Elite isn't that impressive, but remember it features the exact same VRM as the Gaming X, with perhaps a slightly better heatsink, so those results make a lot more sense. The Aorus Pro AX though is a bit of a failure, and again, while these results are technically a pass, and would be reasonable for a board priced below $200 US, it's a fail for a board priced at almost $300 US. Basically, it needs to be running at least 15 degrees cooler for it to be a worthy contender at this price point. Quite interestingly, ASRock's managed to achieve the opposite. The Pro 4 wasn't very impressive at all, somehow peaking at 86 degrees in this test, and while that's again technically a pass, it is a very poor result. Yet, using virtually the same VRM, the Z590 Extreme Wi-Fi 6E ran an entire 16 degrees cooler. And again, both boards used the same Vachet SIC654 power stages, with the only difference made to the cooler and the inductors, at least as far as I can tell, there could be some differences there with the power plane. Whatever the case, the Extreme is a much better performing board when it comes to VRM thermals. I'm not exactly sure why the Extreme is so much better. It could have a higher quality power plane, filtering and so on. So it's hard to say exactly what makes this board so much better. And really it's likely to be a result of a combination of things.
So I've now tested over a dozen Intel Z590 motherboards priced between $170 and $330 US. So we've got a pretty good idea of which boards you should be on the lookout for if VRM performance is of concern. Again, at the very low end, the best options include the MSI Z590A Pro, and then as a backup, the Gigabyte Z590UD. And then towards the mid range, the ASUS Tough Gaming Z590 Plus and MSI Z590 Torpedo are also great value options. This time around, we again found some strong offerings from MSI with the Tomahawk and Gaming Plus. Uh, if you don't need Wi-Fi, then I'd recommend probably skipping over the Tomahawk and going straight for the Gaming Plus better quality VRM and just a better looking board again, in my opinion. And for under $300 US, I think this is probably the absolute best Z590 motherboard there is. The ASRock Z590 Extreme Wi-Fi 6E performed surprisingly well, though I would skip it for two reasons. The feature set isn't amazing at $250 US. It's not bad, it's just not amazing. The ASUS Tough Gaming Wi-Fi, for example, is a better equipped board for similar money, and it looks much better in my opinion. Then the second reason being the enforced power limits that saw the board run at the 125 watt TDP out of the box, while boards like the Z590 Tough Gaming Wi-Fi run parts like the 1100K without any power limits. Removing the power limits can be a bit of a pain. It's not nearly as straightforward as loading something like XMP. So that's something to keep in mind if you don't like tinkering and configuring boards. And then with the competing boards from the likes of MSI Gigabyte and ASUS, enabling the TDP limits is very straightforward and can be done at the click of a button. So it's much quicker and easier going the other way. Moving on, sadly Gigabyte disappointed with the most premium model featured in this roundup. That said, the Aorus Elite was okay and about what I expected and really at $220 it's actually a pretty good buy. So no complaints there. The much more expensive Aorus Pro AX though, well, that board kind of sucked in terms of VRM thermal performance, and for those spending up around $300, you'd be far better off going with the MSI Z590 Gaming Plus. It's just a real shame, as I was expecting big things from that Gigabyte board. Then we have ASUS. The $280 Prime Z590A is a pretty compelling option, really, and was right up there with the MSI Gaming Plus, despite running a few degrees hotter, which really is a negligible difference. The more expensive $330 ROG Strix Z590A Gaming Wi-Fi is a fantastic looking board that performs exceptionally well, taking out top spot in our testing. So really no complaints with this one, other than the fact that it is very expensive, priced $50 above anything else I tested. So while it is certainly a great board, I'm not sure if it's worth the price premium over the Prime Z590A or MSI Z590 Gaming Plus. Overall though, those are my two favourite boards of this roundup, while I feel the Gigabyte Aorus Elite, it's a solid offering at $220 US. The only boards that I'd avoid here include the Gigabyte Z590 Aorus Pro AX and ASRock Z590 Extreme Wi-Fi 6E. Neither of which are terrible boards, I just don't think the Aorus Pro AX is particularly compelling at its price point, especially if VRM thermal performance is of concern. And then, as I said, I've, I've discussed the reasons why I don't particularly like the ASRock board. They are things they could fix with an updated BIOS, but until then, yeah, it is a board that I would recommend avoiding. And that is gonna do it for this one. If you liked the video, like, you can subscribe for more content. I will be doing a B560 roundup. I'll be starting with at least to the two cheapest boards from each uh, manufacturer. So there'll be another seven to eight board roundup, depending on how many boards I am able to get. But yeah, there'll be at least seven. So looking forward to that should be very interesting for those of you looking at the better value 11th gen parts. If you'd like to support the channel more directly and support work like the VRM testing, then jump over to Floatplane or Patreon. The links for those are in the video description. That'll get you access to our exclusive Discord chat, our monthly live streams with Tim and myself, Q&As, behind the scenes videos, a lot of cool stuff there. So yeah, if you're interested, links are in the video description. If not though, perfectly fine. And I would like to just thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.